Hello and welcome to this first ever roundtable at HEC Records, this uh, new venue uh, for our business school near Bastille, that's uh, central Paris. This event is supported by Africa Days and the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center of HEC Paris. Today we mark the 2021 Global Entrepreneurship Week by focusing on being an entrepreneur in sub-Saharan Africa. What makes it unique in the grammar scheme of things? Mwana Bishara in Kiswahili, Usomab Hizinizi in Zulu, Dan Kasuawa in Hausa. These are three words from Africa's most widely spoken languages to designate the word entrepreneur. But what else distinguishes Sub-Saharan Africa's entrepreneurship? This English word that was uh, coming from the French verb entreprendre. This 18th century concept denotes a person who undertakes a project, but originally it also meant being an adventurer. So what are these adventurers on the African continent? What distinguishes them and their works? What are their main centers of activity? And how have they evolved? What could make them unique in the future? To answer these questions and more, I hope, we've invited six current and future entrepreneurs. Four are in our studio and two will be talking to us from the HEC Paris offices in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. They are in last name order, Stephen Biddy, the founder of Hashtag CI20 and Panelist Cash in Côte d'Ivoire. Pakom Izan, creator of AfriSquare Invest. Graziella Kiragu, a Kenyan student in the HEC Master in Management program. Yaya Kone, uh, who founded Coliba in Côte d'Ivoire and also graduated from the HEC program Elite Campus 2019. Albert Mensa, Assistant Professor in HEC's Accounting and Management Control Department and also the CEO of Codabot Ghana. And Ginika Okafor Obamuro, the HEC MBA student uh, who started this year and Nigerian entrepreneur. Let's begin with the new generation. Ginika, you are both at HEC Paris studying for your MBA and you're a retail entrepreneur in Nigeria. That's where you launched Yili, a footwear company. This makes handmade leather sandals using local products and skills only, local. And you're aiming to grow Yili into a global brand. We'll come to this six-year-old company later on. But first, let's take a look uh, at Nigeria. The study by the research, research firm Brighter Bridges puts it at the top of the continent's tech hubs and also we see it leading Africa in terms of productivity and proliferation. What were the realities for you in this startup environment I just described? So basically uh, the journey to entrepreneurship of course it, it's, it's mixed right though it's like highs and lows. Um, when I launched I had a lot of support from family members. Um, so basically it was self-funded. I was working a full-time job and then I was doing that in the evening, right, before I moved in to do that uh, full-time. It was mixed because there, when you're starting, you need an enabling environment to grow your business, you know, to, to be successful. So it's not like we don't have that enabling environment, but it can be hard doing business in Nigeria. It can be difficult, right? Because like you have um, taxes, you have you have a lot of things that can make it um, complicated, you know. And for a young entrepreneur like myself, um, those challenges were they were quite intense. But um, the good thing is there are certain provisions that are made by the um, government that assist young entrepreneurs like myself to access funds. So I started my business in Lagos and there are funds that are set up by the Lagos state government that, um, that helps young entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. Though I didn't um, benefit from that fund, um, I self-funded a lot of things, right? But for young entrepreneurs, there are like trainings um, that they can, they have access to to help them grow and develop their brand. Yeah. 
Diametrically opposite to you, uh, Ginika, is Graziela Kiragu from Kenya, but you've also lived in South Africa and Nigeria. Um, all three of these countries, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria, account for 75% of venture cap capital being put into Africa. That was uh, figures from 2019. How do you analyze this uh, regular progression over the past years? Um, I think, well, firstly, it's really exciting to see that it's growing, um, especially in the, the fintech space. I think the vast majority of the VC is invested in fintech. Uh, with so much of Africa's population being unbanked and the mobile penetration rates being so high, there's a natural demand for this financial inclusion that fintech, I think, very naturally fills. And I think it's very exciting that those opportunities are there, but there is a flip side to it. Um, a lot of these venture capitalists aren't Africans themselves. We have a lot of American funds, a lot of Chinese funds that come in. And I think this lack of African investors also means a lack of African know-how, which can be a little bit tricky to navigate. So I think we really need to encourage more African um, investors to make sure that they know how to navigate across this space. And at the same time, I think this concentration on mainly fintech can um, fuel a certain bubble and that will eventually pop if it keeps going like this. So I think it's actually important that we try to diversify our investments, specifically in the agriculture sector. Uh, it's such a large part of uh, employment in Africa, but it only accounts for roughly 20% of the continent's GDP. So diversifying a bit away from fintech and into agri-tech I think could be great. But overall, I think it's great to see that it is growing and that we have more investments and that demands are being met with innovative solutions. So how does this tally that we've been uh, describing, uh, how, do, how does it tally with realities in another of Africa's business hubs, uh, Côte d'Ivoire? Joining us, uh, as I said, from the HEC offices in Abidjan are Stephen Bedi and Yaya Kone. Stephen, you founded Panelist Cash, which is a service to transfer uh, money through text messages. Many believe this is the moment to invest in the country's nascent uh, startup ecosystem, since it's hard and accelerators have almost tripled in three years. Your experience of the current entrepreneurial atmosphere in this West African nation. Um, hello, I'm Stephen Betty. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, excuse me for my very poor English. I'm a French man. So uh, um, about, about this, uh, the situation of the startup in uh, our area, I think that um, here um, in, in in 1919, after COVID and um, and many situation, all 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 um, invest all investor um, have to to increase investment in our area because um, every uh, startup in Africa um, is so so um, rising uh, across this this period, and uh, the the market is, is starting to to maturity in 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 our area is is is, is for now. No? So for for investor is the 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 the, the right moment. The, the, the to to invest in our area before is uh, too too uh, early many early stage uh, startup and don't invest don't uh, interest uh, sorry uh, investor and uh, I think that um, is the it is about the maturity uh, of our area and um, secondly uh, I think. Um, after the maturity of our ecosystem, um, the, the, the entrepreneurial mindset uh, is, is growing in our area too, because uh, um, in, in Anglophone English zone uh, was um, a be better entrepreneurship mindset. Uh, um, um, yeah, yeah, help me, please. <laughs> okay. 
compare, uh, compare to, yeah. Compare to uh, maybe, uh, be coming back to the, the mindset, so Stephen, Betty, thank, thanks. In, in later on, uh, it is a very important uh, point, but I'd just like to move to uh, your neighbor, uh, Yaya Kone. Um, Yaya, you set up a new construction, oh, sorry, uh, Koliba, um, five years ago, I believe. It's a recycling company uh, uh, that we'll be looking into in the, sec in the next part of the program. This firm came through a support uh, program called Yellow Startup. How healthy is the startup ecosystem in Cote d'Ivoire compared to other West African nations? Uh, okay, thank you so much for, well, for your questions. Uh, so my name is Yaya Kone, so I'm the, the co-founder of uh, Uh Today, I think that uh, when uh, we compare the situations uh, since, uh, you know, uh, for four or five years, I think there is a there is a progression. Uh, there is a kind of progression. This is what uh, Stephen tried to explain in uh, Europe. Uh, for example, like the innovators uh, in Anglophone Africa, you know, the innovations, the innovators in Francophone Africa are mostly in nascent or if you want in early stage. Okay. So the the second point that most African companies uh, do not operate beyond the country in which they are upgraded. So but also some some of innovators from Anglophone Africa appears to be inspiring the neighboring Francophone countries. Uh, to come up to, uh, to me personally, uh, we started, uh, you know, in 2016, but in 2017, we were awaited by the program that you quoted, uh, Yellow Startup. Uh, this program allows, you know, uh, to understand the market, uh, you know, to adapt, you know, our business plan and so on and so on. So after that, what uh, the situations in Cote d'Ivoire, there is a, a great progression because when we look in the books from, you know, from startups operating in, in uh, elf, in elf uh, you know, systems of fintech like uh, Panelist Cash funded by Steven, even if in energy uh, we have, you know, we have basically 10 to 20, you know, uh, most innovators in Cote d'Ivoire who, uh, you know, who was awarded or who uh, took part to some, you know, some uh, program in Ancabero or Acelerado. And today we, uh, we remark that there is a kind of progression. So this is good, but it's not enough. It's not enough because we need more. We need to we need to attract more investments in uh, in our ecosystem. We need to have more maybe uh, uh, business angel. This is you know, for example, compared to Nigeria to in uh, to Cote d'Ivoire, it's not a, it's not the same mindset as uh, Stephen said because here there is no business angel. There is no local business angel. This is a problem. So you know. So I think if you if we want to have a great ecosystem. We need to partnership, even if to public and to private sectors, in order to you know to grow this uh, this ecosystem. So this is the first step that come on my mind comparing to this situation. Well, well, let's see an example of this form of entrepreneurship, this time in Ghana, where our next panelist comes from. Uh, Albert Mensa, you're not only assistant pref professor in the HEC Department of Accounting, you're also an entrepreneur in Accra with three companies. Here are images of one of the two business initiatives, three in business initiatives you've undertaken, centered on poultry. Uh, could you comment uh, these, uh, these images that we're just showing now? Okay, so uh, Pokosi is a location for a poultry farm. Um, Pokosi is known for the uh, interchange, and it's considered to be the largest interchange in, in West Africa, and so what a perfect place to set up a business. Um, uh, so the images you're seeing are actually uh, about the farm. Uh, the size of the farm is around 1,300 uh, uh, square meters. And what we basically do, uh, Basically, we engage uh, a lot of people to help us to produce um, egg, and to do that, pretty much you have to go through the whole um, cycle of business, right? Uh, getting from out in the chicks and um, rearing them to get to the stage, uh, and then of course they start producing eggs, and then of course there's the issue of marketing, and so that's pretty much what the business is about. 
And uh, Ghana is just behind Morocco in terms of the global startup ecosystem, a map that uh, a report published last year by Startup Blink uh, showed us. Uh, what challenges have you faced in, in establishing this farm? Okay, so that's a, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I would actually want to approach this question um, you know, from the perspective of a financial economist. Uh, and so as a rational entrepreneur, right, how, how do I evaluate the situation? So I would pretty much want to look at the cost-benefit analysis. So my objective would be to maximize the benefits while trying to minimize the cost. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about some benefits which you can actually find uh, in agriculture um, in Ghana. So there is a lot of government funding uh, and there's a lot of government support. Uh, you find this in reports that the Ministry um, you know, of uh, Agriculture and Finance comes up with. Uh, you have a, a Minister of Food and Production, uh, Finance and Economic Planning as well, uh, comes up with this report with all these statistics um, about the things they've done for the agricultural sector. And I think that's laudable, that's great. Okay, so we, this is just giving you a backdrop um, of actually the opportunities out there for us, right? Before we moved out, uh, we set out to start the business. Now, talking about the challenges, right? Having this benefit, what are some of the costs potentially that we have to, uh, we have to incur? And challenges can be framed as cost here. Um, the thing is, there is this whole issue of, um, you know, property rights, right, in Ghana. Now, what do I mean by that? The whole idea is, well, do the laws actually protect the way uh, property is acquired and the way property is used? Ghana is doing great uh, in that regard. If you look at the International Property Rights Index, for instance, Ghana ranks uh, number, uh, I think, 61. Uh, in the world and pretty much in West Africa, we are ahead of a lot of uh, our neighbors, our neighboring countries, so that's great. Now that said, there is a bit of a unique situation um, and this is basically something that a lot of entrepreneurs face. Now if you're looking to buy a land, for instance, uh, and you actually want to set up uh, the place and put up a new structure and have your business, you're going to have a, to face the reality uh, that the claim that you have the land Right, it might not actually materialize uh, because then you have someone else come in and say, well, I also own the land. And so you might probably have like five people who have titles to the land and say, well, we own this land. And so the court has to step in uh, and try to resolve the issue. So the first challenge we had was the fact that we had to lose an investment because we acquired the land. And unfortunately, it turns out that uh, we're not the true owners of the land. So that was a lost investment. Now, we could actually litigate this issue, but then this is going to drag on for months and years. And so this was a peculiar challenge we faced. Then there's uh, the second challenge which I want to talk about, okay, because I'm kind of framing this uh, using the cost-benefit analysis, analysis here. Uh, we do know this issue of corruption, right? It's pervasive, it's everywhere. It's, it's not only in Africa, it's, uh, I mean, even, even surprise uh, in the United States, there is massive political corruption as well, right? Uh, you just need to look to uh, Department of Justice reports to Congress, and that gives you information about, you know, mayors, uh, you know, city council uh, officials. But that's an entire other program. We other program. That, that is true. Too. Yeah. So that's kind of one area. So in Africa, our situation is unique because we have another type of corruption. It's not only political corruption, but we have institutional corruption. And so if you have a mix of the two, this is kind of really hard. Now. Question is, how does this, you know, uh, relate to your question? We had an instance where we had the opportunity to access government support, which I mentioned the benefit is right there, but we're like, no, the cost of dealing in the black market for government support is just too much because you don't want to have any side deals so you can have access to the government support. Uh, and so we decided to stay away from that. So this was a challenge. So we have to uh, self-finance everything. Uh, so these are two are the significant yeah. costs and challenges that um, entrepreneurs typically encounter in Ghana. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to some of the, the issues yeah. you brought up. But yeah. finally, we have the pleasure of greeting Pakum Ezan, a graduate from the HEC Executive Master in Finance. Uh, you're the co-founder and managing partner of Afri Square. This is an Ivorian company that aims to address a, a growing demand for inclusive financial uh, services throughout the region. Tell us more about this gap for impact investing funds in West Africa. What are, what are you really um, uh, trying to address here? Yeah, thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, let me thank you to uh, invite me uh, uh, to this round table uh, with uh, very talented co-speakers. Um, well, Frisco Invest uh, um, was born uh, one year ago. Uh, I co-founded uh, this, uh, this venture with my partner, Didier. 
the idea was uh, a very simple and based on a simple observation. Um, is that when you look at the evolution of financing uh, in Africa and in West Africa in particular, um, it's very easy, it's quite uh, easy, not very difficult if you are SMEs or uh, large corporates to get funding with commercial banks and if you are a very small business with uh, uh, monthly recurring revenue. Uh, it's not very difficult to get funding uh, from microfinance institutions. But when you are in between, and when you are startups or SMEs uh, with not monthly uh, uh, revenue, it's very hard to get uh, the, the, this type of, of, of funding. That's uh, the, 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 the very specific of uh, West Africa or uh, and so um, uh, other other parts in, in, in Africa. Africa, it's a very it's the the, the, the missing middle dilemma, and uh, the idea was simple to address this uh, this dilemma in uh, uh, setting up uh, an investment platform uh, in order to help entrepreneurs to get funding, but not only, also to uh, um, help them to provide them uh, technical assistance or uh, capacity building, but above all, network, because uh, everybody knows that network is very important if you want to, to grow a business. So uh, that's, that's my first point. And um, other parts of our strategy, it's uh, very, um, uh, to be very focused on some parts of uh, uh, some sectors, some privileged sectors such as uh, agri-food tech, uh, because uh, uh, as Gerzula said, um, when you look at the, uh, the, the VC ecosystem in Africa, uh, most funding are, are, are driven, are driven uh, toward fintech or a little bit other technical uh, uh, ventures. But uh, agriculture is very important for Africa because uh, uh, when she said uh, Graziella, uh, yes. Graziella, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so, um, uh, we know that if you, if you want to, to fight against unemployment in Africa, you need to, to develop uh, agriculture. So we are very focusing on agribusiness uh, and uh, food tech and also fintech because it's very important to uh, address uh, the, the dilemma of uh, inclusive funds. That's Thank you. Well, let's move to part two of the round table. Um, here we look at how our panelists are succeeding in creating their businesses on the African continent. Um, let's stay with you. I, I'd like to focus more on AfriSquare. As you were saying, this firm uh, has uh, become a pan-African platform of impact investment. Yeah. Uh, you've been promoting investment in sustainable agri-food uh, tech, in fintech, as you were saying, renewable energy also, education and healthcare. Yeah. How's that grown in just that one year of uh, establishing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're still building um, our uh, our platform and uh, we need to be very incremental. We're very early stage in our project. Uh, the, the first step would be to create uh, a kind of startup studio or accelerator in order to have a pipe and uh, after that we will uh, uh, try to, to find funding from uh, GFIs or uh, business centers. But uh, before that we need to um, to set up um, a platform of uh, uh, accelerators or startup studios trying to uh, to build an ecosystem in order to uh, to, 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 move, to move on and uh, our uh, the, the, the two countries uh, where, where we, we want to uh, to begin uh, our ventures um, are Cote d'Ivoire and, uh, and Syria because uh, I'm francophone. I'm from Cote d'Ivoire, so mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it helps. Friend. Yeah, it helps to, to, to begin there. And uh, afterward, uh, we, we will try to, um, to, to, to move on to um, Ghana. Or, 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 uh, <laughs> conquer the world. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? yeah so, so we're still very uh, at the beginning of our adventure, but uh, we, uh, we will be. Uh, 
are very incremental in our strategy. We uh, try to set up uh, uh, three ventures, own ventures, and uh, poultry farm uh, one okay. of them. That's good. So, uh, so yeah, we, we still work on it. Yeah. But is there a priority amongst these different sectors, agri-food? Uh, agri food, yeah, food? Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Albert, uh, Albert Mensa, as well as your poultry business, so you're also heavily involved in the establishment of a company uh, selling 3D printer technology in Ghana. It's called Kodabot Ghana, and it's with the help of foreign partners that you're offering um, technology products that range from 3D printers to their accessories. How has this international collaboration uh, been set up and evolved? Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so I actually started this whole thing um, just like selling uh, the 3D printers uh, as kits. And when I say kits, basically the printers come as uh, so disassembled components, right? So you have to actually assemble the printers from the scratch. Now, is there, is there a market for that? And that's a good question. And so we had to test the waters and see if this, this worked. And so what we started doing was reaching out to manufacturing companies that wanted to print you know, like a sample of the uh, product, right? like prototypes and stuff like that. We'll get contracts from uh, companies and we'll do that. Um, and in certain cases, we as well earned a lot of revenue from actually building the printers from the scratch. We charge a, a bit of service fee for doing that because there's this hardware part. It's a software part as well. And then there's a configuration part, and then of course you do the printing, right? So there's just like several layers of activities involved, and this was an exciting project. Well, we got to a point where it was like, okay, well, we need a larger base, um, a larger clientele base. So the way to go about that would be, since we actually sell in technology, we could reach out to you know um, high uh, end institutions, for instance, uh, a switch of highlighting in Ghana that specialize in technology. And so the whole idea was, well, you have a department that's doing technical stuff. Why don't you work with us and we will train your students to know how to assemble a printer from the scratch, to know actually how to use the software, and to use the firmware to configure basically uh, the printer to work. And then later on, you're going to have departments within uh, your institution that want to print things in, uh, in 3D, right? You really want to see it in 3D. So your architectural department, for instance, would want to have a miniature form of uh, you know 3D arch architectural designs. So this is pretty much how we started. Then recently, what about the international partnerships that you've? Created? So that's a good point. So that leads me to the next, uh, the next point. Mm -hmm. And so recently, I have partnered for my company in Ghana. Has partnered with um, uh, Kodabot, and Kodabot is basically headquartered in Hong Kong. Uh, and so they offer a lot of um, you know coding courses that links basically software to hardware, right? Coding to hardware. So you use code to control a robot, you use code to control a drone, you use computer programming basically uh, to develop a smart What was their company. interest, sorry uh, to interrupt you, Albert, uh, in investing in a West African nation in like that, Ghana? So to part, partnering, uh, it's, it's more of a partnership and uh, we, we are taking up all the investment and we're just partnering with them basically okay. uh, to provide the service and the product on the market. So they are not investing. So that's, that's why we're doing everything on our own. Now, the international touch to that is yeah, so what we're currently doing is we have actually started launching in Ghana, uh, Bot, and we're working with schools. Uh, you know, you can think of kindergarten schools, uh, lower elementary schools, and the whole idea is to work with them so we can infuse this tech-based education into the system, right? Because the priority has been on uh, basic education. And now, our next plan is to actually go to our neighboring countries. So the agreement we have with uh, Bot, uh is kind of like a West African presence in the entire African um, continent. If you think about that, that's, I know that's kind of ambitious but these are long-term um, uh, objectives. Yeah. Graziella, Kirago, uh, when uh, you listen to these exchanges, you, you've not launched your own company or startup quite, um, quite yet. Are you tempted? Uh, yeah, I would say so. I think it sounds very interesting and it sounds like you all like have a very positive impact. I think for now I'll focus on finishing my studies, getting some experience <laughs> and, and maybe in a few years. Uh, you're already widely traveled and you've seen the business sectors in your native Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria and, and Rwanda. Indeed, you wrote a paper on the economic development of rural women in uh, Rwanda. Um, Rwanda figures highly in rankings for investors since barriers to entry are almost non 
non-existent. For you, is there, for example, a real potential in this private sector driven economy? Uh, I definitely think so. I think beyond just the, the investment opportunities, I think what Rwanda is doing really well is uh, the way the government acts. So my research specifically focused on how the female majority parliament, which is the only one in the world, uh, can enable rural entrepreneurs uh, that are females. And from this, I actually found that since this majority female parliament has come into being, a lot of women feel more represented. Their main needs like access to uh, finance and education have grown. And so I think this combination of low barriers to, enter, to entry and a lot of investment opportunities, coupled with the government actually listening to the population and providing them with what they need, creates a space that, that is just pure opportunity. And I think that a lot can happen there. Rwanda was a world leader in uh, the removal of plastic bags in, in the economy. Maybe they can actually be an example uh, that goes well beyond uh, its, so. uh, yeah. African borders and maybe even the African continent uh, I think elsewhere. So, definitely. Ginika Okafor Obamuro, as we said earlier, you're juggling your MBA uh, studies with running your crafts based uh, business, Yili. Um, you're helped by a strong team of fellow Nigerian business people. It's been six years years now. Um, how did you create this brand? Okay, so basically I saw a gap in the market for quality leather footwear. So as an entrepreneur, I grew, coming from an entrepreneurial family and being Igbo, <laughs> we're always finding the next option. So we decided that, I decided that, okay, this gap, we have a lot of potential in Nigeria. We have like great artisans and craftsmen and we can use their services. So I decided to partner up with local artisans to um, start the footwear business. So we make everything in Nigeria and we source all our products in Nigeria and our footwear are manufactured local artisans. And that's how we do. Earlier, um, uh, our, our friends uh, in, um, in Abidjan were talking about mindset, and I read that you had to change the mindsets of people to buy local. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? So basically, there is this obsession with everything, like everything for it, right? Um, and prior to entering into the market, a lot of people Maybe because like some of the products that were manufactured in Nigeria, some of them were not up to the standard that um, the customers wanted. So because of that reputation, a lot of people prefer to buy things that are not made in Nigeria. But um, in, I think it was 20, uh, 2010 or 20, in 2009, Something I, I can't remember, I forget now the exact year, but basically the governments made a lot of policies that encourage businesses to produce in Nigeria. And there was this um, massive campaign about like buying Nigeria to grow the Naira and a lot of businesses like mine started springing up, a lot of fashion designers and people were realizing that wow, we actually have a lot of talented people that make quality products. So, of course, that may be easier. However, what I do as well is like when people come for our pop-ups, I kind of like show them like so maybe one of like the famous brands that they like and their products and they're like, this is handcrafted, the quality, we have a guarantee for our product. So if you buy from us and anything happens, you can exchange it, right? And I felt like that fostered a lot of confidence um, in the minds of our customers and kind of changed the mindset. So now, not only do we have a lot of people who patronize us, we have a lot of repeat customers, which to me is success. And you're able to juggle this at the same time as being here in Paris, uh, working very on a very demanding MBA degree. Huh? Yes, yes. I have an amazing support system. I have amazing um, assistants and craftsmen that help. They buy into the uni dream and they're able to work without me physically being there. And also the way the company was set up, it was set up that it would run irrespective of where I am. And that has really helped in basically um, running the company from Paris. 
inspiring. Let's jump back and leap back uh, to the African continent. Yaya Kone and Stephen Bedi, you both founded companies in Abidjan. Uh, Yaya with Koliba, uh, devoted to cleaning up the streets of the economic capital. And Stephen with uh, Panelist Cash, uh, which as I said earlier, is a means to transfer money via SMS text messages. Uh, I read that financing is fast improving in the country and that mobile operators are providing a, a strong boost for startups. Uh, your experiences, uh, let's start with Stephen. In our area, in, in, uh, particularly in um, Ivory Coast, MNO um, boosts startup ecosystem. MNO boosts startup ecosystem because the interest of the MNO is to develop the, the ecosystem and the, the mobile money. I, I, I talk about mobile money because um, in in uh, in my sector fintech, uh, MNO is a very big uh, a, a actor. MNO is very big actor, and um, the the problem in our area is uh, MNO boosts startup uh, ecosystem, but uh, MNO limits. Uh, the, 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 grow, the growing of, of those startups because if the, the fintech uh, become too big to, to, to challenge MNO, MNO, uh, uh, for example, uh, in Africa, we can see a, a, a challenge in, uh, uh, um, between MNO and WAVE. For example, so um, the the investments of uh, MNO is very um, limited to 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 control the, the the numeric economy and to control the 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 fintech mobile money and startup ecosystem in general. After after that, um, the good news is. Um, in, in our, our area, um, our startup uh, with resilience um, in, in, um, be, because no financement, no business angel, no uh, um, VC in our area. So our startup uh, can be develop uh, uh, our product with organic, Growing, we we don't uh, focus our strategy in uh, uh, fundraising and other other thing uh, to 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 develop our our company. So, um, because we are resilient, the 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 the, 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 the investments we are we we. We search is is not the very uh, big um, amount. It's not very big amount, so um, we can do more thing for our company with small money, with uh, uh, small. Um, uh, um. approach. Yaya yeah, Kone, yeah, uh, you describe yourself uh, as a serial social entrepreneur and Koliba is just an example of this. So we see a few pictures uh, illustrating its impact. Environment and low tech technology, those are the, your key words. Tell us more. Uh, yeah, um, unfortunately, you know, um, in African cities, uh, you know, the management of plastic waste is very catastrophic uh, for lack of budgets and, and suitable solutions. For example, to give you figures, in every course, we produce more than 220 tons of plastic per year. But unfortunately, it's just 3% that have been recycled. That, that means that we have maybe 97% uh, that have been going to landfills, etc., etc. 
And so uh, for this reason, you know, we decided maybe to focus on this uh, on this sector and to and to set up, you know, uh, a solution, an innovating solution, maybe to tackling the, the the problem of plastic waste. Uh, so for this reason, so. Um, uh, in 2017, we begin with uh, a setup of mobile technology, enable households, you know, uh, to uh, to sort the waste. And uh, at the end, we have a kind of rewarding uh, system to encourage people, you know, to search, uh, sorry, to, to sort the waste. And at that moment, to go to the very chain, we set up a plant which uh, able to, to produce, you know, plastic flakes. And we uh, we send this platform to those manufacturers. We use it, you know, to uh, to um, to product new, new material. This is kind of economic circular. And beyond that, we have a program of education regarding uh, protect your planet. Is a kind of uh, indicated, indicated uh, you know, uh, program uh, oriented to people at schools where you know we talk about the environmental situations. And today, concerning the the you know um, our strategic uh, you know uh, development is very clear. But we, we actually we just want to focus on, on Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, we are actually we are set up uh, a plant on uh, maybe two thousand uh, you know meters in order to have a big plant and to produce more than uh, 50 tons of plastic waste in 2023. So this is our, our, our ambitions. Wow, well, perhaps uh, some of the 3D equipments can help in these educational drives uh, that uh, Yaya Kone uh, was illustrating there with Koliba. On to our third part of the program, and that is basically how is Africa unique in the world of entrepreneurship? What does, uh, what does make Africa different to other continents? Uh, again, the focus here is on sub-Saharan Africa. We, we hope to devote a future roundtable to the countries north of the Sahara. Um, well, studies show that this region beats all continents in terms of the per percentage of working age adults devoted to entrepreneurship, for example. These entrepreneurs are mainly women um, who focus on social impact more than profits uh, and um, and growth that their uh, their male counterparts uh, seem to uh, promote there was a study by both Stanford University and the Tony Elumelu Foundation that indicated that also there's an exchange mindset um, which is very strong exchange of products and services uh, this also views employees as equals with um, valuable opinions and it's mainly women who see business less formally than their male counterparts. Perhaps sweeping but important insights into these, these differences that the continent uh, has been pushing forward. Um, and finally, there, as was said earlier, there are differences between areas. Uh, the mindsets in the West, East and Central Africa. In the West, for example, there's more of a profit-oriented language than elsewhere, says this study. Let's stay in, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, Yaya Kone and uh, Stephen Betty. Your response to these conclusions uh, from this study that came out uh, two years ago. Uh, yeah, Steve. Think, th thanks so much for your question. I, I think that yeah, the study um, uh, it's, uh, it's great. Uh, what makes, for example, our ecosystem uh, unique, the environment is not the same as you quoted. We have, first of all, the barrier of language, you know. Uh, for example, when we want to talk to people uh, in France, you know, we need to, we need maybe to, to master at least uh, English language. So, you know, most of entrepreneurs here, you know, uh, don't have the skills. So this is a, this is a barrier. But also, um, the ecosystem is, uh, you know, most of the, the, most of the, you know, what can I say, it? Um, the good projects are in the early stage. You know, we need to go. We need to go beyond that. And uh, uh, for this reason, for example, uh, we decided with Stephen Bedi, we decided to uh, to set up a kind of uh, association called uh, Save So it is a kind of association gathering. You know, uh, many startups. And or in uh, in this association, when we push back, you know, uh, ideas, solutions to gather, you know, public both uh, private sectors, you know, to uh, to rise up the ecosystem of startups. And but also we invited maybe some MNOs to join us, you know, to stimulate this uh, this ecosystem. But I think that. Uh, 
there is a there is a there is a great news because among this association we had I mean three or four startups we succeed to you know to to raise money. This is good, but this is not enough. This is not enough. We need to go. We need to need to do more, and uh, we think that in two, three, or four year coming years coming, yeah, we uh, we will do many many things. This is uh, my my point of view. Afri Square can help in this kind of leap up. Uh, uh, Pakum is on. When you hear some of these conclusions from this study, uh, how do you respond? No, very, very interesting point uh, and a very interesting question. Uh, I think it's um, a very interesting topic because uh, uh, everybody knows that uh, when you look at the population of, uh, of West Africa, in the 30 coming years, uh, the population is expected to, to double. Uh, so uh, that means uh, uh, great potential and uh, increase in terms of uh, household consumption, uh, increase also in terms of uh, demand for jobs. Uh, so I think. Uh, um, First, uh, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in West Africa, it's uh, one of the, the, the best way to, to, to try to fight against the, the problem of uh, unemployment. Um, being said that, uh, I don't think that entrepreneurship in Africa, in West Africa in particular, it's very different from uh, other parts of the world. Entrepreneurship is discipline and uh, respond to a certain code and rules. And uh, we, we need in, in Africa, in West Africa in particular, to uh, try to, to educate, train a new generation of leaders of entrepreneurship uh, in order to create the jobs for, uh, for, for, for tomorrow. Uh, education is something we'll focus on in the next part. Uh, but Ginika, uh, you, you were talking about mindset uh, and so also the, this idea that it seems to be accepted that women can be entrepreneurs, can be world leaders in, in terms of the numbers, uh, but there's these different priorities compared to their men, uh, male counterparts. Uh, how do you respond? How, how does uh, that corresponds with the realities you've experienced in, in the um, years that you've been an entrepreneur, a woman entrepreneur? I think that the, um, naturally women are nurturing, right? And they want to provide opportunities for everyone because they have seen the struggle. As much as we try to move past um, the way the current um, reality of a lot of countries is still patriarchal, right? Um, in my own experience, one of the ways I've, I've conducted my business, I conduct my business with empathy, right? And I conduct my business with loyalty. So one of the first things I do, I did, was to ensure that the people that I work with, they buy into the dream. So once you are able to get people to buy into the dream of your business, they can give you the loyalty. And as much as I want, it's, an, it's a profit-driven business, but I feel like um, my business is more than profit. It's not about profit alone, right? We want to ensure that the people who work for us, who work, who, who like, who spend their time working for us, they're compensated properly. We see them more as a family than as, um, you know, as employees, right? And because we have done that in, um, the effect is they are bringing us a lot of loyalty and a lot of trust. So our artisans, they trust that we have the best interest for them. And because of that, they put a lot of love and care in producing our footwear. And I've seen that with a lot of the uh, partners in business. Once people can see that they can trust you and everything is in about money. I'm not saying that women are not profit oriented. We are, but we see beyond profit. We believe that fostering the right relationship is key to actually growing and sustaining a business. And I feel like that's what makes women unique entrepreneurs. Graziella Kirabu, uh, women are confronted with a lot of glass ceilings in France and in the, the States and elsewhere, and it's, uh, it's debated inequalities of salary and just uh, the, the fact that, you know, executives, the percentage uh, drops dramatically. How does that uh, compare with uh, your experiences in, in the countries you've been to in, uh, in Africa, as I said, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, and, and Rwanda? Um, I think it compares very 
very similarly. I think it's uh, also a very societal aspect that comes into play. I think Rwanda in this aspect is quite unique. I believe it has one of the longest paid maternity leaves uh, and it's really trying to restructure the way society uh, approaches the differences between men and women. Uh, and this has an impact in the entrepreneurial world? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so because I think it reinforces the message that women are as capable as men. I think as Ginika was mentioning, there is a more inclusive approach to business, which I think is actually maybe a better approach to it because women are often at the heart of, of their households and they provide for it for their whole families. And so taking this inclusive approach, I think is a, in line with a lot of cultures we see. And I think it is the way forward as a collective rather than for individuals to, to rise to the top. Uh, Stephen Betty, uh, if you want to jump in remotely from uh, Abidjan, please don't hesitate. I think there's a bit of trouble in, tech, in, in the technical sphere, but you're welcome to uh, contribute about uh, the, the unique nature of entrepreneurship in Africa. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to turn to you, uh, Albert Mensah. When, when you hear about these distinctions in mindset, for example, and what the Guinea, uh, Guinea has, uh, experienced herself in terms of for selling local, and, and a kind of inferiority complex about uh, foreign goods compared to local. What's your experience of this in Ghana, where you are selling a very tech high technology product? Right. Uh, well, I think I'll probably say that uh, we have a certain foreign taste to our product because uh, we're partnering with foreign, uh, you know, original manufacturers, and we just deliver the product and render it back. Uh, so I would actually uh, want to say that it's been a great experience thus far, right? Uh, to see a local business person promoting a product, right? Um, we did not locally make it, all right? So I could not actually speak to her issue, her experience pretty well, but I can just share um, you know, my experience from this, uh, this point of view. And uh, the fact that it's tech based, everyone's interested in, in a product uh, like that. Um, and it's just because the whole idea of tech based education right um ed tech uh, for instance uh, and, and all that comes with it right talking about robots talking about drones all kinds of things vr ar these are kind of like fancy uh, technology which everyone's talking about and with the advent of big data ai blockchain technology um, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, to kind of like come out and each for ourselves and try to render this this part so that's why it's been going great uh, as to the local uh, local experience i'll probably say the poultry Farming could speak to that issue. Um, so, with the poultry farm, for instance, okay, so we are actually in a competition with uh, other probably experts in Ghana, right? Pretty much that into that business. So, there's a heavy Chinese presence, and they, they actually control a huge uh, pile of market, right? And supply a lot of eggs. And so, you have like startups like us, because we've only been in business for like two years. And we are competing with these guys, right? So these guys have heavy machinery, and we're like, well, we are taking it step by step, like you mentioned, just step by step. Um, how do we compete with these guys? So it's, it's, it's been a challenge, but then we try to just serve, you know, portions of the market where we think we can actually succeed, and it's been going great. And so I think pretty much what I can say from all of this experience is, well, you need to actually target a particular sector of the market where you think you can succeed and just go for it without worrying about, you know, these foreign players or, uh, uh, you know, these uh, foreign products that are likely to threaten the success of your product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our fourth and final part focuses on the role business schools play or should play to help entrepreneurship in Africa. But for this fourth part, we focus on the business schools like HEC Paris here near the French capital and Yamoussoukro's National Polytechnic Institute, uh, INPHB. Uh, the two faculties uh, signed a double degree course agreement in 2017, by the way, and they've been building on this in the past four years. Let's start with you, uh, Graziella Kiragu. Uh, you've had a, a rich and varied student career already. Uh, you were at uh, Leiden University in the Netherlands for multidisciplinary courses mixing economics with politics and history. You were also an academic consultant for Amnesty International. I'm very curious to hear about that. Before arriving here for your master's degree in management, one of uh, HEC's most reputed uh, programs, you um, told me that your long-term 
aim is to return to the African continent to translate these studies into a positive impact through business. How are these degrees helping you prepare for this? Um, well, I think my undergraduate degree helped me and within it, I specialize in the region of Africa. Uh, so I think it helped me a lot to understand which historical uh, factors have contributed to Africa's current positioning in the global economy uh, and explain a lot of reasoning behind uh, the way governments in Africa act, like linking it back to colonialism, for example. Um, I think my time as an academic consultant in Amnesty International was very interesting to see how these organizations approach this change. But ultimately, uh, personally, I believe that we can really foster a lot of change through businesses and through the private sphere as well. Uh, I think more developmental approaches have been tried throughout the years and haven't proven as successful as we may have hoped, looking at where the continent is now. So I think focusing back on people, on individuals, trying to educate them, uh, like Yannicka said, producing locally, creating a, a skilled local labor force rather than importing foreign labor, I think this is at the key of driving uh, overall development on the continent, uh, and hence the masters in management to try and understand more what it takes to, to run a business, to start a business, and to be effective in it. But these tools that, you've, uh, that you're gathering uh, here in France, in the Netherlands, uh, and elsewhere, uh, how um, easy is it to translate them to on the ground realities that you know uh, in Africa? I think uh, the hard skills you gain are transferable anywhere and are valuable anywhere. But what's really important is to understand the context and the culture you're dealing with. Uh, so fortunately, having traveled across the continent, I like to think I have a, a bit of an idea of the realities and I can understand them and link them back. And that's also why I mentioned in your first question why it's so important to have African actors and people with know-how of the continent and with a really deep-rooted understanding to transfer these skills and to understand them and understand that business in Africa is different than business in Europe or, or in America. Linika Okafor Obamuro, you've trained first as a lawyer at the Nigerian Law School and also at Leicester University in the Midlands of Great Britain, um, and then entrepreneurship both at INSEAD and HEC Paris. You've really gone for the pinnacles. <laughs> How have these studies already helped you in the building of your footwear company in Nigeria? Um, thank you very much for that question. I feel, I feel like um, the degrees and the knowledge that I'm getting there has helped me in terms of structuring my business, right? But in terms of every day, you can't, I say that, that's based on my own personal experience. You can't learn your day-to-day -day runnings of your business from, um, from an internship, from an international MBA school. The reason why I see this is because there are certain nuances in the African culture that are indoctrinated in the way we conduct business. So you can... For example? For example, in, in when you're... If you're going through your course and it's like you do, you do your market research, you segment, you do all these things. Well, you can have all this um, data available, but if you're coming into like uh, a system like Nigeria, if a community market like Nigeria, we have a lot of um, um, peculiarities that are, you know, um, that are peculiar to Nigeria. And if you want to apply the textbook, um, <laughs> the textbook yes. formula to run your business in Nigeria, you're actually going to fail because things don't work. The way things are done on book is different from the way things are done on the ground. So to me, I feel like as much as this um, good, great business schools like Harvard, INSEAD, HSC, you know, they're doing a lot in terms of educating people, but they can tailor, especially for like their African um, students, they say if they can partner up with uh, professors in Africa or even some of the African business schools to understand the market. I feel like there's still a gap in the way um, business is thought, right? Um, even some of the case studies that we use, they're all well and good, but you can't apply that system in Nigeria. You can't apply that method in Nigeria. If you do, within six months, you're going to go bankrupt because that's not how things are done. We're, we're unique in our own um, ways of conducting and dealing with business, and which isn't even wrong in its, um, in its own right, right? It's just that it's peculiar based on our culture and our, day-to-day -day nuances.
<laughs> Paco Maison, uh, I see you nodding your head a, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You've experienced a diversity of French universities yeah. and business schools, including HCC Paris and Schema. Uh, how do you feel uh, about these specificities uh, that uh, um, that were just uh, evoked now, and um, and how they can apply uh, what you've learned in these yeah. schools in France to uh, the African realities? So, thank, thank you for, for, for this question, uh, which gives me the opportunity to thank uh, uh, all my professor uh, from, from HSC Perry for the, the excellent uh, uh, courses. Um, I must say that um, uh, I, I know um, that HSC Paris and uh, so on, came out part of the of great institutions um, have definitely a great role, a primordial role to play um, for the, the development of the, the continent. Uh, because uh, we are, we, everybody knows that in 2050, um, we will see uh, maybe around uh, two billion of Africans, and so uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, it could be a, a big problem, but it could be also a chance for for, for the continent. But we need to train, educate uh, this population. We need to to create some jobs, and um, uh, as I learned uh, from uh, uh, HSC Paris. It's a, a mindset. It's a, a new way to, to 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 understand the market wherever you are, and uh, um, effectively, I'm very agree uh, uh, with uh, Graziella and, uh, okay. and and my neighbor uh, because uh, you need to to understand the specificity of the markets. Uh, you cannot uh, have the same approach in terms of market when you want to operate in Asia uh, uh, compared to in Africa. It's, it's not the same. Uh, for instance, um, when you, you take a film like uh, Monsieur Bricolage, I don't know if you know that. Do it yourself uh, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. these shops. Uh, I think this film uh, uh, playing to, uh, to create uh, subsidies uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong or in Asia. But uh, in this part of the world, uh, the, the the man or, or woman, nobody like to uh, to to uh, how can I say? Uh, for, for on the on the Sunday, nobody like uh, to, to go by, by by self uh, to work. You mean to, or to, to, yeah, to, 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 to do to, DIYing? To work. So it was a great fail. Uh, because but that's in Asia. What about uh, Afri, Afri Square that's trying to address, address yeah. something that doesn't exist? Uh, is that changing a mindset, uh, for example? No, it's, uh, it's uh, not a good example because uh, I'm from <laughs> I'm from Cote d'Ivoire. So, yeah, but you've uh, been trained uh, here. Yeah, yeah but uh, I, I spent 20 years uh, in, in Africa. So for me, I, I, uh, I don't know the, 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 the specificity of, of the market. So it's not a, a big challenge for me, mm. but uh, definitely when you want to, to operate in Africa, and I swear, you need to uh, very be, uh, uh, pay attention, be very precaution uh, about the, the the mindset or about the, the market, about the specificities of the market. When you take, for example, Jumia, uh, Jumia managed to operate uh, in 11 countries in Africa, uh, and uh, in some countries, uh, nobody have uh, an address. But uh, Jumia uh, uh, find a solution to deliver goods, even if people haven't uh, address. So mm. it's a, a good example. We need to adapt our mindset in, in the markets. Well, what about uh, business schools in Africa and how they prepare future entrepreneurs? Yaya Kone and Stephen Bedi, uh, you've had experiences of education on um, both uh, continents, Africa and Europe. Your feelings about how well these schools are preparing future entrepreneurs uh, for the challenges of opening businesses in Africa? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, uh, today, you know, uh, we see more and more business schools, uh, you know, uh, including, you know, the, the entrepreneurship in the curricula. This is, uh, this is uh, awesome. 
but it's not enough because when we take the content, it's not the, the you know, it's not the same content that maybe we're experiencing from business school in uh, in, Europe, in Europe. So um, the recommendations that we uh, we should address maybe to uh, political leaders in, uh, in every country, maybe it's just to update the you know the contents in uh, entrepreneurship and to start you know uh, to start you know starting entrepreneurship not at the university but the earlier stage this is this is important and doing doing that maybe I think that we we will have you know this mindset that we're talking about because this is the fact that in uh, in our country most of people or most of students you know don't have this mindset having this mindset is you know it's I don't, I don't, I don't say it's necessary going to business school, but it's a one, uh, uh, it's a one step. It's the one solution that we, we we can do it. So the recommendation maybe is to update the content and try to you know to amplify the you know um, the program and try to see if, for example, we can mix you know some program according to some business some businesses in uh, in overseas and locally. So this is uh, what we can say. Albert Mensa, you, you've also known higher education experiences in different continents, but your travels have taken you to uh, China's uh, Xiamen University and the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, that's where you completed a PhD and master, respectively, before becoming a professor at uh, HEC Paris. As an entrepreneur, what have been the most useful educational tools for building a business in Ghana that you've gleaned from uh, these three establishments? Okay, uh, so I probably would want to start with uh, my training um, all the way. Um, yeah, I think uh, that was, you know, those were early formative years of basically building the spirit of entrepreneurship, right? In me, within me and uh, getting me, you know, just like, you know, um, all tunes. Spirits, yeah, and it was about the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. So I learned the principle, uh, which was uh, actually something I picked up at the undergraduate uh, level, um, pretty much. There's this whole idea, investment concept, okay, of higher risk. Higher return. Now, uh, undergraduate, that's in Ghana. In that's, Ghana, yes. right. So I did my undergraduate in Ghana. So higher, the higher the risk, the higher the return. And so typically, all entrepreneurs are risk takers, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and therefore, you have to take a risk, right? Uh, so that's kind of one concept which is still applicable today. And I see that actually not only my education in Ghana, going through uh, basically uh, different parts of the world, uh, pretty much is something which is very useful. So that's one thing that I pick. So instead of just like, you know, saying, well, I want to be safe, I don't want to take the risk, and let me just buy a couple of safe assets, financial assets, and put my money there, I'm like, no, I want to go all in, and, and I want to take the rest. So that's one of the very useful uh, concepts. So how do you maximize your returns? The most, the, the most beneficial way, right, um, would be to start something, right? Take a risk, and once you take the risk, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can fail or you can succeed, right? I'd rather choose uh, to succeed than fail, and so I'll, I'll try to take the risk. And, and failure is not a dirty word in yeah. many cases. <laughs> it is in France, it's, a, it's anathema, and uh, banks don't lend to you again. Right. In the US, it's not quite the same. In terms right. of business school's ethics and uh, what you picked up in, in China, right. uh, for example, uh, how have, uh, have they Some of the tools uh, have approached failure uh, in business? Well, one thing, one thing you can say about uh, the typical Chinese business person is actually what we refer to as hard work. So, one of the things I was fascinated about when I went to China was just the sheer will to keep going, right? I even when things are not going great. Right. And so they work really, really hard. And I think that kind of like shaped my uh, perspective about things as well. Uh, and, and it was still surprising, you know, the work all the way to like 11 p.m. Uh, and then they close, right? Pretty much, of course, you might say there's, there's this break, uh, two hour break, uh, where they have, you know, basically siesta and, uh, you know, come back and all that, but it's just incredible to see people just like keep going. And so that, I kind of picked that whole, like, that whole thing um, about hard work from there. The one of the things I can also say, um, the business schools that pretty much I picked up uh, in Asia and a couple of places, including Ghana, it's a, financial management tools, right? How do you do investment appraisal decisions? So these are things that business schools teach, and this is very useful. It doesn't actually matter if you are uh, in a developed world or uh, underdeveloped world, or developed country, the, fund, the capital appraisal, capital uh, budgeting tools are very useful. It's always that, right? You always have to make an analysis 
uh, NPV analysis, net present value analysis, internal rate of return, and so on and so forth. Then, of course, there's a the whole issue of uh, venturing into a new area. How do you really, really um, approach the whole thing? So there's this idea of SWOT, right? Yeah. Strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat. And a lot of business schools stage this. And this is still a concept which is applicable. And so you can actually generalize this uh, irrespective of jurisdiction. And I think this is great. Uh, and you've, you've applied it to yeah, your I'm own uh, ventures. <laughs> yes, I've, I've actually applied it. Now, now, you're the only one with one foot in two camps. That means right. uh, you've both uh, been a student in, in several establishments, but now you're teaching yeah. as a, an academic. What would you like to see business schools curricula evolve towards to better answer the challenges of entrepreneurship in, in Africa? Okay, so I, I think I'll probably say uh, the first step would be trying to move away from the one size fits all approach to teaching, which is basically what uh, Giga spoke about, right? You, you actually give uh, the classic model about how to start a business. Uh, and the whole idea is that, well, this model will work anywhere you go. But then, uh, thanks to the conversation we just had, which is the peculiarities which are associated, right? This might not work. Um, and so the way I see things going forward, because I've actually been a student before and I'm teaching right now, what I do right now is, well, without any making, without actually making changes to the current uh, curriculum, right? Um, you could, as a professor, if you're a teacher, right? You could actually point out areas where there are significant differences between what's out there in the developed world and what's out there in the in the uh, underdeveloped world. world. Yeah. So what I do, for instance, is I teach financial accounting, and there is a principle in accounting which we call, uh, you know, timeliness principle. And the whole idea is where right, if you're an investor, if someone invests in a company as an accountant, you want to release information, okay, in a very timely manner, so that that information helps in your decision making. The slightest delay, okay, you have in releasing that information is going to cause them to make a bad decision at some point. Now, now every accounting professor, okay, across the globe teaches this principle, but they always assume that information is released in a timely manner. Now, if you were to go to a developed country like in the U.S., which is like a, a model country which everyone uses, uh, you can actually release information in a matter of a few hours, right? So it's a major event, for instance, right? The company, you know, has expectations. Well, like, well, let's. Take COVID, for instance. Well, we expect that, well, in the next month, uh, probably is going to take a hit. And they quickly release that information through a type of filing we call AK filing, right? You're not going to see that in, in Ghana because uh, timely information will actually be held for several months before you, the information is released or even when the annual report is released. So I kind of like point out this after the way. So I love this something. I will be surprised if some professors are doing this. That would be great, but it's something I try to do because I teach a global MBA class and pretty much people are from everywhere. You really want to know uh, what you're doing and you want to tell them exactly what the difference are and the significant. Now, so coming back to your point about what changes can be made to the current curriculum, right? So I see, I just see making really great uh, inroads in this in this respect, the collaboration with the university in mm -hmm. Abia Coast, mm -hmm. for instance. And, and I do read about the collaboration with the Ivorian government, right? Where they had to send uh, some of their ministers and stuff to uh, be specially trained by to see that is great. This gives them the exposure to understand uh, the Western context. And as well, as you see, to basically see how these guys perceive things, right? So that's one way uh, to go about it. So I, I'm going to encourage like business schools to like just do more of this, collaborate even with uh, uh, African entrepreneurs, you know, those that have made it, um, and just try to you know, have student exchanges, right? Student intern uh, in Africa as well. So increase what is just nascent or is starting to build up start, start, more, more in business schools. And then there is this second thing that I would want to talk about, which is about requiring students to take a course in. Uh, development economics and I think that should be a core course for everyone in a business school that, you, don't, you don't have to be an economics major student to do development economics and development economics basically is a branch of economics that basically talks about how to improve the you know the fiscal the economic and the social health of developing countries right now if you make this compulsory pretty much the students that go through the system will have this whole perspective of how to improve situations in developing countries. And so therefore, if they go and take any other course, they actually going to see things from that angle. Okay, well, we know this course is about this model, well, but we know from this course that, well, you can actually improve the fiscal health of, the, of a developing country by doing so and so. And that helps them to kind of like map, up, map out every single um, scenario. And I, I do think this is what business schools can do most, just push for um, this kind of change. Yeah. Developing further bridges, strengthening further bridges, them yeah. with, uh, between yeah. business schools yeah. and between maybe uh, business schools and governments. Unfortunately, we've reached the final part of this special debate on entrepreneurship in Africa. There's just time for concluding remarks from our panelists. 
Yes, we've reached the end of this roundtable on entrepreneurship in Sub-Saharan Africa and what distinguishes it from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, this exchange, by the way, is part of HEC Paris' engagement in the Global Entrepreneurship Week uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. And that seeks to empower, empower new entrepreneurs uh, like yourself, uh, Graziella Kiragu, for example. Um, this year's focus has been on education, inclusion, governance, and collaborations between networks and I believe we've covered a lot of these uh, fields thanks to our six panelists. We just have time for final words from each one of them and I'd like to turn to the future uh, with one simple question for each one of you that prolongs our central theme. Uh, how can entrepreneurship in Africa become even more unique in this early 21st century? This time I'll reverse the alphabetical order and I'll start with uh, Guinea I think, first of all, we should, in Africa, we need to understand the strength we have in human capital. I think if we can invest in our human capital, there is a room for um, growth, there is room for making, for basically starting up businesses that are innovative, right? And how do you invest in human capital by providing the right um, enabling environment through education, training, you know? If the government can do that, I think the sky is really the starting point for Africa. Albert Mensa, um, the assistant professor at HEC's uh, accounting and management uh, control department and CEO of, uh, uh, well, of Codebots uh, Ghana, but also uh, involved in two other important ventures. How can entrepreneurship in Africa become more unique? Uh, thank you for the question. I probably want to take a bank on uh, basically what you shared, because uh, my insights uh, would, would uh, kind of like if I provide more information in this respect. Technology is an area that's kind of close to my heart, right? And so uh, uh, what I've seen uh, in Africa, in a lot of West African countries um, here, is that uh, the focus has been on basic education. And they've turned the to prioritize basic education over technology-based education, right? And so if we can actually, because of the 21st century, everyone's talking about, I just, I, I, not long ago I spoke about, you know, the fact that there is now a massive wave of interest in big data, AI, blockchain technology, right? How do you actually get your population to be up to speed with this? The only way is if you're to support as a government to invest a lot in tech-based education. So it's something I would actually want the government to do. And then one more point, uh, if you actually look at those who are, who are involved in tech-based business in Ghana, you know, technology space, um, it's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly dominated by men. We do not have a lot of women who are actually into this, all right? So I will actually encourage, um, you know, the government to will really target uh, the brightest kids when you're young, okay, the girls, and try to give them scholarships, follow them all the way to the highest level of education. And then when you're done, you provide an environment and the necessary infrastructure for them to actually try to be entrepreneurial, uh, or even hire them if you can actually set up a joint venture, um, um, you know, for a lot of people who have ideas, you could potentially do stuff like that. And, and this way you give up, um, you know, just, the quality of education um, and break uh, some of the class ceilings we were mentioning uh, earlier. Yaya Kone, uh, of, uh, founder of Koliba and a graduate of Lead Campus 2019, the future for you. Yeah, I, I think that um, for me, you know, many of Africa's chronic challenges uh, have historically been addressed with ed. Okay, so for me, uh, with the rise of technology and social entrepreneurship, however, uh, I think that the time has come for us to take responsibility. You know, for solving our own problems. So um, many of Africans' challenges can be turned into opportunities uh, with the help of social enterprises. Uh, and the young people across the continent are creating their own future, you know, using the power of social entrepreneurship. And uh, to make the most of this power, I believe we need to channel it into three key areas, you know, uh, ethical leadership, education, and, uh, and technologies. And I believe in that. Thank you very much. Uh, Graziella Kiragu, who is still a student in the Masters in Management, I think until 2024. Huh? Yes. Your future vision of how you could make African entrepreneurship more unique. 
Um, well, I really agree with Ginica. I think uh, human capital is a really important element. I think also improving the access to finance for startups, mainly at the beginning, is really important. And encouraging more intra-continental trade to provide businesses with more opportunity to scale up and to work collaboratively. And uh, for Africa to keep running at the forefront of the digital economy and keep innovating, I think those are the most important aspects. Unfortunately, Stephen Bedi uh, couldn't uh, stay with us till the end, uh, but uh, I'd like to turn to Paco Maison, creator of Afri Square Invest, which is uh, implanted already in Côte d'Ivoire and having its sights also on Senegal. Yeah. Your vision of the future, to how to make African entrepreneurship more unique? Yeah, I'm very agree with uh, uh, what Urazela said. Uh, uh, one minute before. Uh, in fact, we, we need to improve um, the, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Africa in uh, 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 help startup, uh, West African startup or African startups in general to uh, get funding. So we need to uh, um, to help them to um, to get money from VCs around the world. And uh, to do that, I think one of the big issue is uh, the perception of risk in Africa. And we know that the risk reward is a, a very incentive for uh, invest, uh, all investors uh, all around the world. Uh, but uh, the, the problem is that the perception of risk uh, from the Western perspective uh, is not very, um, uh, not very exact. Uh, from an African point of view. Uh, so I think um, there is an opportunity, there is uh, tons of opportunities in Africa for uh, Africans, uh, for entrepreneurs, for African entrepreneurs, because uh, uh, they need to, um, uh, to, to try to, 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 to be very educated and uh, uh, to, to, to increase their business. Uh, but we need before that to uh, improve the the, the, the understanding, uh, understanding of the market. But also, above all, I think the 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 the, the gap we need to bridge the gap in the, the valuation of the financing. It's a very important. And so, this is my last point. I think. Thank you very much. A grand merci to all six of our panelists. I'd also like to thank uh, Laurine Assin and her Maran team who are behind the production of this roundtable. There's also the technical team for Morpho Production, uh, led by Paul Henri Vallad, uh, who've done a fantastic job in bringing this together. Uh, Gabriel Mazzini and Philip Auster from the HEC Paris International Affairs Department. Uh, and another Thank you goes to Carole Lababi, uh, who heads the marketing and communications department at the HEC Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. Finally, the team led by Inge Kerklo de Vif and Antoine Le Prêtre uh, here at HCC Records. Uh, a hearty thank uh, for welcoming us to this wonderful new uh, studio. I'm Daniel Brown. Thanks for watching and hoping you will join us again in the near future for other roundtables organized by HCC Paris. And we finish with a Nigerian proverb. A man or a woman cannot sit down alone to plan for prosperity. Goodbye.